MZTV. Good morning, everyone. I was going to take you to the passage today concerning the Hosea verse, where God says, I'm going to call those who are not my people, my people. And how the replacement theology people, that is the people who say we are true Israelites, thus erasing God's plans for the actual Israelites. I was going to expose that, but I'm going to do that tomorrow. <clears throat> Today, I want to give you a critical lesson on the metaphor. Because uh, ignorance of metaphors has launched this entire We Are Israel movement, this entire preterist movement, replacement theology movement that, well, we're the spiritual children of Israel, so God is fulfilling all his literal promises to Israel in a different people, in a different way, and it's all designed to give God an excuse for not literally fulfilling his promises to literal Israel, but the problem as I've said, when you do that, is that you've cast doubt on all of God's other promises. Now, what other promises is God going to fudge on? What other promises is he going to sort of fulfill, but not really as he stated it? All right. And it all comes down to an ignorance of the metaphor, a simple language tool, a writing technique that makes language strong. Difference again between a simile and a metaphor. A simile says that something is like another thing. Very easy to understand. A metaphor says that a thing is that other thing. It's the exact same comparison as a simile, but it's a literary technique that makes for strong, colorful language. And the metaphor I am dealing with today is from Romans 4, 16. Paul actually calls Abraham the father of us all. Therefore, it is a faith that it may accord with grace for the promise to be confirmed to the entire seed, not of those of the law only, but to those also of the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. In another place, Paul says, you are all the children of of Abraham. You are, you are the sons of Abraham. So the replacement people see this verse and they get all excited. See, we are, the Bible says, we are the seed of Abraham. We're the sons of Abraham. Abraham is our father. But no, he's not literally your father. And you are not, quote, spiritual Israelites. If anything, you are metaphoric Israelites. This is what they mean to say. When people throw around this term, we're spiritual Israel. No, spiritual Israel are literal Israelites who are spiritual, as opposed to literal Israelites who are fleshly. That's what a spiritual Israelite is. What they mean to say is we're metaphoric Israelites. We are compared to Abraham in one aspect and in one aspect only, because this is a key of the metaphor. A metaphor relates one thing to another thing, but there's only one point of contact. There's only one common thing between these two opposite things being compared. And if you extend the metaphor beyond its intended comparison, which many, many, many people do, and this is exactly what the spiritual Israel people are doing. You go off into some abs absurd, ridiculous, unscriptural conclusions, and it's all ignorance of the metaphor. If only Paul had said, Abraham is like the father of us all, then you would say, oh, in what way is Abraham like the father of us all. Well, if you'd read all of Romans 4, you would understand that it, in the area of faith, Abraham believing something God says, 
that you will be the father of many nations, believing which Abraham, or facing which Abraham believes it of the God who is calling what is not as though it were. So it's in the faith aspect. You are sons and daughters of Abraham. Oh, Martin, but we're of the nations. No, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. If I told you you are like the sons of Abraham, again, the question would naturally be asked, oh, in, in what way? But this is what needs to be asked with the metaphor as well. The metaphor, again, rather than saying that something is like another thing, says that the thing is the other thing. When in fact, it is not the other thing, not even close, but it's only similar to that thing in one strong but specific aspect. For instance, Jesus said, I am the door. Now, a man is as different from a door as can be. No one would mistake a man for a door. But Jesus is like a door. Ah, really? In what way is he like a door? Well, he's an entranceway. He's the entranceway to God and to life. In no other way is Jesus Christ a door or like a door. A door is made out of wood. Jesus Christ was made out of flesh. A door has a handle. On and on and on it goes. But this is how mistaken it is to extend a metaphor beyond its intended purpose. Instead of saying, for instance, that ex-Chicago Bear linebacker Dick Buckus is like an animal. Anybody who ever saw Dick Buckus, the middle linebacker for the Bears, play, you would say, well, Buckus, he's like an animal. But no, that's not what we say. We say, Buckus is an animal. Buckus is an animal? No, he's not. He's a human being. But the point is made, isn't it? Yeah, please tell me that the point is made. So another place where the Abraham comparison comes in is in Galatians 3.29, and the spiritual Israel types trip over this big time. Now, if you are Christ's, consequently, you are of Abraham's seed. Or Paul could say, you are Abraham's seed. And again, it has to do with faith and faith only. In no other way are you Abraham's seed. You're not literally related to the guy. So you're not descendants either of Ishmael or Isaac. It is a comparison, but it's a strong comparison called the metaphor. Again, if Paul had only said, it's like you're of Abraham's seed. But see, that kind of writing sucks the life from bold points. And a metaphor is a bold point. And Paul is a strong writer. You are Abraham's seed, trusting that his audience is smart enough to understand what a metaphor is. Because not even, think about this, not even natural Israelites, actual Israelites could be the literal seed of Abraham. Because a seed is a tiny little hard thing that you put in the ground. So even that is a metaphor. So it's a metaphor within a metaphor. You're not a literal seed as far as being a hard, crunchy thing that you put in the ground, and you're also not a literal descendant of Abraham. Even Martin Luther made the huge mistake of thinking that the bread of the Last Supper was actually Christ. And the Catholic Church has built an entire industry around ignorance of the metaphor. Jesus held up the bread and said, this is my body. Boom, a metaphor. You see the danger now of taking a metaphor beyond its intended purpose. If Jesus had only said, you know, you see this bread here, you guys, this, this is a lot like my body. And then he breaks it and gives it to them to eat. So the purpose of that metaphor obviously was obvious to me. It's, it's not obvious to many, many people, but this is the same mistake this spiritual Israel crowd is making. The bread is like his body and that it would be broken 
on the cross for the life of all. In no other way, just like I am the door, in no other way is Jesus Christ like a piece of bread. But Martin Luther used to say, this is my body, this is my body, the whole transubstantiation thing, that, 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 that bread becomes the literal body of Christ and that you're literally taking Jesus Christ into your body when you eat the bread. That's how stupid it is to make a mistake concerning metaphors. There's a metaphor in Isaiah where he says, all flesh is grass. Oh, really? All flesh is grass? Well, grass and flesh are as different from each other as can possibly be. But if you read on in that passage, you will find out that the grass withers away. Oh, and flesh withers away. So in that aspect only is Isaiah relating flesh to grass. I mean, you could go into a butcher shop, order a pound of steak, and what if the butcher handed you a pound of grass? Wait a minute, I didn't order grass, I ordered steak. What kind of establishment is this? The butcher says, well, do you believe the Bible? Of course I believe the Bible. Well, Isaiah says all flesh is grass. So if I give you grass, I'm giving you flesh. That is how stupid it is to make a mistake concerning metaphors. And this is how stupid the Israel replacement people are. And they based the whole thing on these metaphors. Paul is often comparing the body of Christ to Israel in certain ways. Let's look at some metaphors in the scripture, other metaphors. Here's one. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. I'm in Isaiah 64, 8. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the clay. Now, this is a good one because in Romans 9, Paul jumps on this and he says, has God not the right over the clay that over us? Has God not the right over vessels of honor and dishonor to make one vessel this way, one vessel another way? And the analogy is used, potter and clay. Is God a literal potter? No. Are we literal clay? No. But Isaiah says we are the clay. You are the potter. Oh, well, there's one point of contact. Because people have said to me, I'm not clay. They, they get mad. I'm just saying you're clay. I'm not clay. Oh, the first thing they say is, I'm not a robot. You're saying that God manipulates me like a robot. I'm not a robot. I say, no, that's not the inspired metaphor. The inspired metaphor is you are clay. And then they'll say, well, I'm not clay either. I'm a human being. I'm living. Clay doesn't, clay just sits on a table. How can you say I'm clay? Clay is inert. It just sits there waiting to be molded. I'm a human being. I live and move. Have thoughts. Hey, numbnuts, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. I know you're not clay. God's not a potter either. God doesn't work at a pottery shop. No, he doesn't. But what if I say, you know, you are like clay. Mm, in what way am I like clay? Well, the point is, the point that God is making is he can manipulate human beings, which is what you literally are. He can manipulate animated human beings who think they're doing their own thing. He can and does because he is the potter. <laughs> See, I'm using a metaphor to explain a metaphor. He can manipulate human, human beings. He does manipulate human beings as easily as a potter manipulates clay. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23.1. Metaphor, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, why don't the spiritual Israelites claim to be sheep? If they're consistent, they would claim to be sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, if he's a literal shepherd, then you're a literal sheep. Why don't you go around bleating? Meh. That's what you ought to do, you spiritual Israelites, you sons of Abraham. You like being called a son of Abraham? You think that makes you a replacement Israelite? Well, then 
dress up in a sheep suit. Hmm? Why don't you do that? Deuteronomy 32.4, he is the rock, speaking of Christ. Oh, that verse, when the rock followed Israel in the wilderness, the rock from which they drew water, Paul says, and the rock was Christ. The rock was Christ. So many people get the idea then that it was actually Christ, the Son of God, who followed Israel around and like he was the water dispenser or something like that. But it's a metaphor. The rock was like Christ in that the rock pictured the coming one who would give them living water, which again is a metaphor. Living water is also a metaphor. Water being that thing that really refreshes you in the desert, becoming an analogy of the Spirit giving you life. So it is illicit to extend a metaphor. And again, one of the biggest mistakes ever made on this was when Clyde Pilkington, he has a book on this about husbands and wives, and he takes the analogy in Ephesians 5 about husbands, love your wives according as Christ loves the ecclesia. There's one point of contact comparing Christ to a husband, my God, and a wife, they are also very different. There's one point of contact, which Paul's, Paul explains in the context when he says, therefore, a husband shall be loving his wife as his own body. The one point of contact in that metaphor is that as Christ nourished the ecclesia and did not destroy the ecclesia, being the stronger one, thus husbands also love their wives as their own body. It's a throwback to the good old saying, love your associate as yourself. No man abuses his own body. No man ought to abuse his wife. Christ could have destroyed the Ecclesia, but Christ nurtured the Ecclesia. That's it. That's the point of reference. But I was at a conference in Washington State where Clyde put Christ on one side of a chart and the Ecclesia on another side of a chart, and he went point for point. He said Christ is the savior, the success person, the lover, the embracer, the steadfast. And then he compares wives to the ecclesia, point for point, saying that wives are sinners, wives are failures, wives are the beneficiary of the husband, wives are the resistant ones, just like the ecclesia is. Wives are the inconsistent ones. I'm squirming in my seat, watching Clyde condemn all wives in the room and giving husbands this, this charge to be just like Christ, that Paul was not at all doing. But this is what happens when you extend a metaphor beyond its legal bounds. I'm going to close here with a quote from A.E. Nock concerning the metaphor, and I wish everybody understood this. I'll close with this. Figures, especially those of likeness, must be strictly limited to the point or points of contact, for it is axiomatic that there is unlikeness in all other particulars. And I, I'm writing a book against Clyde's book because it just condemns husbands who, thinks, who, who think to themselves, I can't live point for point like Christ lived. I can't sacrifice everything. This is what Clyde expects husbands to do because Paul's comparing husbands to Christ and wives to the church or the ecclesia. And again, it goes to ridiculous lengths when you break the law of the metaphor. The force of the simile back to A.E. Nock, depends on unlikeness rather than likeness. Same thing with the metaphor. It depends on unlikeness. They must never be used as if they were true in fact, but this is what people do. They take you are of Abraham's seed and they treat that like fact. You never base doctrine on metaphors, but people do it all the time. The Catholic Church, this is my body. They base an entire doctrine on a metaphor. It is unwise to use figures of speech as a basis of reasoning. This is what the Catholic Church did. This is what Clyde did in Ephesians 5. Very damaging. For the point of contacts are limited to those stated or apparent. And in Ephesians 5, Paul states it. And when Jesus said, this is my body, he didn't state it. He demonstrated it by breaking the bread. Thus, when Paul speaks of betrothing the Corinthians to Christ, he refers only to their singleness and purity, right? He wants to present the ecclesia a chaste virgin. Oh, that means we're the bride of Christ. 
We're like a virgin in every other way. That means we can't have sex or whatever. People, if you're going to take the metaphor beyond its legal bounds, this is the kind of crap you come up with. This is the kind of nonsense and foolishness you come up with. The figure does not include any other aspect of betrothal. As far as that phrase Paul said, I betrothed you as a virgin to Christ, does not include any other aspect of a betrothal or refer in any way to marriage it is confusing to connect it with such figures. Okay, there we go. Another example I give in my book is that I say, third grade students, tackle your homework according as Dick Butkus tackled running backs. I'm comparing homework to running backs. I'm comparing third grade schoolgirls to Dick Butkus. In what way is a third grade schoolgirl like Dick Butkus? There's thousands of ways that a schoolgirl is not like Dick Butkus. But the point of contact in third graders tackle your homework according as Dick Buckus tackled running backs is, is concentrate. Buckus was maniacally focused on the task at hand, which is destroying other human beings. Third grade girl, tackle your homework as Dick Buckus tackled running backs. Or if you want to use that in a metaphor, and I'm watching a third grade student really concentrate on their homework, I said, that girl's Dick Buckus. That girl is Dick Buckus. Can you imagine extending that one beyond its legal bounds? You get some pretty wacko doctrine. That's how wacko the replacement theology doctrine is, that we of the nations are actual Israelites or spiritual Israelites which they count somehow as actual Israelites because they consider it to be the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. It's not.